I'm not sure what your struggle is. If you have like allergies that affect you in the different seasons as they change, you become more and more um, stuffed up. You have congestion, all these different things. Uh, but definitely the people on TV are trying to sell you those things as if you need them. You see those commercials all the time, just these different allergy medications. And they come and they always present the, the same commercial. It's the same commercial over and over again. It's like this black and white despondent beginning and a person is just suffering and coughing and wheezing and then all of a sudden they take this medicine and everything's in full color and it's this wonder drug and wow you have to have this wonder drug and then all of a sudden it says yes this wonder drug does that but there may be side effects and then they start to list some side effects which sound kind of innocuous at first they don't seem too bad you know they're like oh you might have some itchiness maybe a rash then they start to get really severe, like you might lose some internal organs, okay? Internal bleeding, things like that. Might develop a British accent. You don't know what would happen if you start to take this medication. And there's all of these symptoms that might happen if you take it. I don't know about you, but every time I see those, I go, even if I struggled <clears throat> with allergies, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take that. If that's a possibility, okay? There's a mere possibility that I might develop one of those horrible symptoms that you just told me about. I'm not going to do it. It's amazing that I will think that way with something that is just a mere possibility. But the scriptures have this warning. This is not a possibility, but a promise from God. God opposes the proud. And he gives grace to the humble. That's not a possibility. It's not, hey, if you choose pride and humility, this might happen and that might happen. God opposes the proud and he gives grace to the humble. We as a church, we just prayed for humility in the, the prayer a few moments ago. We were trying to ask God that he would remind us that he's with the lowly. So how do we maintain a mindset of lowliness? What do we do to make sure that we have the correct thinking, that we don't exalt ourselves, that we don't worship ourselves, that we don't live for our own pleasure, but we live for God's? You know one of the great ways that a Christian can do that? Is studying the doctrine of sin. When you think about the doctrine of sin and its effects, it has a very humbling impact on you, doesn't it? Because you realize what sin ultimately is. If I stop making the mistake of defining sin or categorizing sin based on how it affects humanity, and it does, we're not trying to deny that fact. But if I do what the scriptures tell me to do first, which David would do in Psalm 51 and say this, against you and you alone have I sinned when I define sin as an offense and rebellion against my creator and the fact that he's come to save me humbles me. We as a church, hopefully so far in the book of Romans you've seen, never skip over the fact that we need to talk about sin. And in our text in the book of Romans today, it's going to show up again another time with another chance for us to be humbled by it so that God will give us the grace that we need to live for him. Turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, we're going to enter a new section today. Romans 5, we're going to look at verses 12 to 14, but this is really a big section between chapter, uh, verses 12 uh, to 21 where we're understanding the fundamental realities that lie behind what took place in our justification from sin. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 14 will be our focus this morning. You can follow along as I read. It says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. Today we're going to see the glory of God displayed in Adam's sin. And it's good for us again, as I have tried to bring up in the intro, that we think about the idea of Sin. If, you, if you've never done this, you should probably read the book Holiness by J.C. Ryle. It is a great 
uh, work to focus on the practical outworking of holiness, listen to what he said helps a believer live for God. He says this, people will never set their faces decidedly towards heaven and live like a pilgrim until they feel that they are in danger of hell. I'm not here to sugarcoat it for anybody this morning. If you're outside of Christ, I believe you to be going to hell. And I don't say that judgmentally. I say that because I think that that's the destiny of everybody in the human race outside of Jesus Christ. And if I realize that I have been saved from hell, I will decidedly live in this life as a pilgrim. Not trying to build castles that are made out of sand that can be destroyed very, very easy but living for the next life. But I have to be convinced that there was a real threat to my life because of sin. I have to understand it as a reality and I have to make sure I know that it is an offense towards a holy God. And notice how Paul does it here in Romans chapter five, verse 12. He says this, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man. We're gonna understand the doctrine of sin by understanding who this one man is. And if you heard later on in the text, uh, verses 13 and 14, this is the man, Adam, who brought sin into the world. Now, interestingly enough, as we focus on Adam, we're going to better understand the work of Christ because we're going to see this comparison between the two. But to make sure we understand the fundamental nature of sin, why don't you write this down, number one on your outline. Let's recognize Adam's impact on humanity. Let's recognize Adam's impact on humanity which is what the Apostle Paul is saying is necessary for you to gain a greater appreciation of the work that Jesus has done for you. What were we told for the previous three weeks? I hope those last sermons were an encouragement to you, where over and over again we were told we can boast, we can walk around with confidence, we can live a life that makes a difference for the glory of God, because we boast, we brag, we draw attention to, we speak per persuasively about what God is doing. We boast in God, we boast in our suffering, and we boast in the hope of glory. But did you notice, over and over again, Paul did this. He spoke in the first person plural. We do this. We get to do this. This is the outworking of the doctrine that Paul has taught us. Again, as we've tried to say, all theology should be practical. And if this is true about salvation and what Paul has built up so far, then we should walk away boasting in God. And if you got your Bibles, why don't you just flip over to chapter 6, Romans 6, verse 1. You guys are going to want to bring some seatbelts when we go to Romans chapter 6 because it's going to get very, very bumpy as we go through this chapter. And it will be confronting to you the way that you live your life. But if you just listen to the opening paragraph, notice Paul starts to do something similar. Romans 6, 1 to 4 says this, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Do you hear that interesting refrain again? We. So 5, 1 to 11, 6, 1 to 11, Paul's including himself into this. But in this interlude, chapter 5, verses 12 to 21, there's no first person plural. This is not talking about our response, but trying to get us to understand the realities, the truthfulness of our salvation, what is going on, not just mechanically, but maybe the intricacies of the work that God has done for us. If you fail to have an appreciation for theology, maybe it's because you're lacking knowledge of the intricacies of it. And Paul is going to go to great pains to make sure you understand this has absolutely nothing to do with what you do. This is what went on behind the scenes. So let's recognize Adam's impact. Letter A underneath that, you can just write it down this way, and I'm sad that I have to say this. You do it by affirming his, 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 his historicity, okay? This is how you uh, understand Adam's impact on human, humanity, by affirming his historicity. His historicity. And I did not think about how that would come out of my mouth as I wrote that out. But now I'm saying I really wish I would have chosen different words. The historical Adam is what I'm trying to get across. His historicity is really difficult to say. But I'm going to get through it. 
his historicity. And I, I, I'm sad that I have to say that. But do you realize in a day and age where people want to attack the Bible, they will do whatever they can to try to deny its teachings. And sometimes how they do that is denying the historical reality of Adam. Adam was a mythical creature. God created by evolution. All of these different things they, they bring into the forefront to exonerate them from needing a savior. But do you think Paul believes that Adam is a historical person? Well, if he's making a comparison for your salvation with the person of Jesus Christ, let me ask you this question. Do you think Paul believes that Jesus Christ was a real person? Do you think that he has confessed to seeing him, understanding that he was a, a physically person risen from the dead on the road to Damascus? He was caught up in the third heaven to know Jesus Christ. Do you think that Paul believes Jesus was a real person? Yeah. So why would he compare him to a myth? Especially if he's saying the effects that happen because of Adam spread to all of humanity and the effects of what Christ did can spread to humanity, it would be foolishness to say that he's not historical. In fact, Paul does this in a number of places. You can just write down 1 Corinthians 15. I'll, I'll read it for you real quick. 1 Corinthians 15, I think it starts in verse 42. This is a comparison that Paul is going to make over and over again. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 42. Yeah, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is, sown is, it, what is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. It, if there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. And thus it is written, the first Adam became a living being. Notice what he's quoting. He's trying to make us understand that Adam was a real living human being. So because of that, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But if it is not, but it is not the spiritual that is firstborn, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was formed from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Do you see that Paul is treating Adam as a historical reality? And he's going back to Genesis to say this is the case. This is what happened. God formed him into dust, breathed life into him, and he was the first representative of the human race. But you know who else believed that Adam was a historical person? Jesus. Matthew chapter 19. If you got your Bibles, go to Matthew 19. If you want to call yourself a Christian, you should probably affirm the things that Jesus affirms. That's just a pretty simple standard like line of reasoning. If Jesus says it and you're a Christian, then you believe it. Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 to 7. There's the talk about divorce. When is it lawful for somebody to divorce? And they are quoting these different uh, rabbinical traditions. And Jesus comes and he just says, well, why don't we just go to the Bible? Verse 4, Matthew 9, 14. He said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and therefore and said therefore a man shall leave his father and mother hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh so they are no longer two but one flesh what god has joined together let no man separate jesus quoting from the beginning saying god created them this is the beginning he created them male and female that's adam and eve and then he quotes from genesis 2:24 to say he put them together as husband and wife, Jesus believed this to be a reality. You know what might also help you is just the number of times that Adam appears in genealogies. I'll just have you write down these three. We won't turn to them, okay? Uh, Genesis chapter five. Write down there's a genealogy there. Adam appears in genealogies. Uh, Genesis chapter five. First Chronicles 1.1. 1, 1. Adam starts out the genealogy there. First Chronicles 1.1. 1, 1. And then interestingly enough, in Luke chapter 3, verse 38. So Genesis 5, 1 Chronicles 1, 1, and Luke 3, 38, which says Adam was the son of God. You have to affirm the historicity of Adam 
to say that we don't have a historical Adam is to lose out on what salvation really is, as we're going to find out as we work through this text. So we need to do this, understand his impact on humanity by affirming his historicity. See, I've got it down already. I could say it 50 more times if I wanted to. Uh, Letter B, though. Let's acknowledge... Our adversaries. By acknowledging our adversaries, we will understand the impact of Adam on the human race. By acknowledging our adversaries. And this goes back to Romans chapter 5. So if you, if you turn to Matthew 19, go back to Romans chapter 5. So we're acknowledging our adversaries here. Romans chapter 12 says this. Therefore, okay, so he's going back to the previous section, which talks about the salvation that we anticipate coming in the future the reconciliation that we possess now, and the declaration from God that we are not guilty in our sins, all of that comes because of this. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. I'm going to stop right there. We've been introduced to a a number of other players who are going to show up over and over again in this text. And it is sin and death. Actually, if you look in the original language, there's the definite article with both of those, the sin and the death. And the way that it plays out in this text, Paul is personifying these realities that have come into play into God's great drama that he's created with the human race. So he's saying in Genesis 1 and 2, when God creates the heavens and the earth and he creates them very good, sin and death are not in the world, but Adam's action functions as a portal, a a gateway, an on-ramp for sin and death to become participants in God's creations. And they are very destructive participants, the sin and the death, personifying these realities. When we talk about the sin and death, this text is going to tell us that they can both reign Okay? They're going to have the, the attribute of kingly authority over the human race. When Adam opened the door for them to come in, what is the, what is the monster that you have to invite in the house can't come in? What is it? You guys know it. Come on. It's a vampire, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. You have to invite. The vampire can't come in until you invite it in. Okay? So we have sin and death on the outside. They don't get to come in until sin is opened by Adam. And so this is what's going on right here. He's, he's now allowed sin and death to come in. And they didn't just come in and take up a little carpet space. They're reigning over the whole house now. They're there and you have to submit to them. It is appointed unto man once to die. And after that comes judgment for sin. Everybody is now accountable because of Adam and Eve's action in the garden. Not only does sin and death reign, sin in chapter 6 will enslave So it's going to come in and enslave the human race. And then it will, in chapter 6, it will pay out wages. The wages of sin is death. Chapter 7, sin will take the law, which is holy, good, and righteous, and utilize it for these nefarious motives to trick people and actually going deeper into sin. These adversaries that God has brought in are an incredible foe that Adam led in through his his sin. But it's good for us to, I think, go back and just read the whole scene as it happened in Genesis 1 through 3. So if you got your Bibles, let's go back to Genesis 1 through 3 and let's acknowledge the adversaries that came in and the devastation that happened. Genesis chapter 1, you'll start in verse 26 and 27. This is just a refresher because we, we did this when we were going through Uh, Chapter 1, verses 18 to 25, we said that is probably allusions at least, if not direct reference to God creating man, man's rebellion because of idolatry. And in chapter 1, 26 and 27 of Genesis, it says, it says this. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven, and over the livestock, and over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over it. And then drop down to verse 31. And God saw that everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and it was evening and morning, the sixth day. What do we have? the pinnacle of a pristine 
creation from God. Everything the way that it should be. Harmoniously devoted to his glory. And everything's working out. And God comes in to Adam, if you flip over to chapter 2 now, take a look at verse 16. And he says, Adam, I'm giving you responsibilities, which again is a privilege. We negatively look at responsibilities at times as something that is just pure duty, but that should never be our, our thought if we're created in the image of God and he has blessed us with the responsibility to carry out. Chapter 2, 16 says this, after putting him in the middle of the garden to work it and to keep it, verse 16 says this, and the Lord commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil You shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. This is not a myth being made up. This is the first human interacting with God. And can you notice the extensive kindness of God here? Every tree in the garden is yours. What did Adam do to deserve that? Nothing. Adam was dust and God formed him and breathed into him. And then he said, all of this goodness that I've created, that's yours. Have at it. I'm telling you, this one tree over here, you don't touch it. Now let me ask you the question. You don't need to answer it out loud. But does this make God come across as stingy? Does it make God seem like a killjoy? as if he was setting up Adam for failure? Or are we misinterpreting it when we go, look at the lavish kindness of God. Everything's at your disposal. I gave you this responsibility. You have authority over everything that's been delegated from me to you. Just don't touch this one tree. Now flip over to chapter three. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the beasts of the field. Chapter 3, verse 1, that the Lord God had made. And notice, he said this. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Do you want to know what's at the heart of every sin? The desire to be autonomous from God and be your own. And that's exactly where the devil goes. But remember where Adam is. Adam's not like scrounging for food. Adam's not hurt. Adam's not desperate. He's in pure delight. That's where he finds himself. God has created everything good for humans to enjoy for his glory. He has everything at his fingertips and a relationship with his creator. And all it takes is a little doubt that comes from Satan. Did God actually say. I read this interesting, really fascinating article. I think it was in the Atlantic. It was written by a person who lives in San Francisco. I don't know if any of you are from San Francisco, have been there, visited. Um, People just proclaim the, the beauty of San Francisco, just how glorious it looks up there. But over the years, there have been a lot of poor choices made by the political regimes up there that have caused it to turn from this beautiful environment to an infestation and cesspool of sin. It's just bad. And this was coming from a writer who's a non-Christian, like secular, just saying our our town has been devastated. Our city is gone. It's, It's not beautiful anymore. We have drug addicts everywhere. We have crime rampant in the street. No one wants to live here. Everybody's leaving. Why does that happen? This author wrote this just incredibly stunning line. Let me see if I can pull it up for you here. Incredibly stunning line, saying that the people of San Francisco finally rose up 
And they rose up, and what they did is they kicked out their um, district attorney. And this is what they said. This is such a beautiful line. They did this because he didn't seem to care that he was making the citizens of our city miserable, okay? So they're kicking this district attorney out because of his lax policies and the, the backwards thinking and all of his ideology, listen to this, it was in service of an ideology that makes sense everywhere, but in reality. And that is a stunning critique. His ideology makes sense everywhere, but in reality. Why? Because God made the world to function according to truth. I want to steal that line because it's so good and say that's exactly the mindset that Satan tries to do to make people miserable. When sin and temptation come into your life, what are they doing? They're trying to make you live according to ideas that make sense everywhere but reality. When the temptation came to Adam and Eve, did it make sense to them? Yeah, I want to be like God. I want to have this fruit. I want to know good from evil. Makes sense everywhere, but where? Reality. When they bite into it, they realize, oh, this doesn't work. This isn't what I wanted. It didn't deliver what it promised. It cannot satisfy, and now I'm separated from God. Sin is an ideology that makes sense everywhere, but reality. Why? Because God made the heavens and the earth. And when we go against his design, just think of what the movement of transgenderism is. An idea that you can be happy, you can make this up. Yes, I will feel better if I change the design of what God made me. It makes sense everywhere, but reality. And you see the devastating effects of that. Sin does that, and it did it in the garden. And because of that, adversaries were brought into our reality, sin and death. Listen to how it was described. Verse 7 or sorry, verse six, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was to be desired and to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Isn't it interesting, one of the first outcomes of sin is shame. What they had previously before, no shame, is now rampant between two people who supposedly love one another. But it's not just that shame, it's the separation that has come from God. Notice, they heard the sound of the God, the Lord God, walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. See, when Paul in Romans chapter 5 is talking about sin and death, that sin and death in the physical sense, yes, but also spiritually speaking. Sin and death is a physical and spiritual reality. At this moment, we're going to find out that Adam pulled the plug on his life support and is slowly beginning to die. But immediately he experienced what it means to be spiritually dead, separated from God, not wanting him, knowing that you are sinful in his sight. And notice that the curses that come upon them, enmity between you and the woman, a hardship and offspring, he brings now curses on the ground and he says to Adam, um, for you were taken from dust and to dust you shall return. This is the curses that have been brought in the adversaries because of Adam's act. It's important that we acknowledge him as a person because now it helps us make sense of the world around us. Do you realize that this is how you craft a worldview? And biblically speaking, if you deny the historicity of Adam, you don't have a biblical worldview because you can't make sense of all the corruption, all the destruction, all the heinousness, all the disgusting sin that goes on unless you go, oh, I know why it's like that. It wasn't always this way. It wasn't designed to be this way. But now because of this reality, sin and death have infiltrated and they Rain. Do you guys understand Adam's impact on us all? Go back to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Acknowledge the adversaries. But Paul doesn't stop there. Verse 12, he says, Just as sin came into the world through one man, that's Adam, 
and death through sin. And so death spread to all men, and here's three words, because all sinned. Paul is now transitioning to talk about not only the impact that uh, Adam had on God's creation because of his sin and the devastation and the curses that were brought upon it, which so to, will show up again in the book of Romans. If you know Romans, chapter 8 says, what about creation? What does creation do? Creation is groaning because it's been subjected under the power of sin because of what Adam did. Paul is just recognizing all of that in this, uh, this context, chapter 5 to chapter 8. But there's something else more here in this text in these three little words, because all sinned. And they might look like three simple words, but if I could show you the mountain of books on my desk right now and the pages and pages that have been fought over these three words and what they mean, hopefully by the end of this you'll realize why they are so important. So number two on your outline, write it down this way. Realize the devastating consequences of Adam's sin. Realize the devastating consequences of Adam's sin. This is the consequences that are given to you and I. What, are the, what is the outworking that comes to us because of Adam's action in the garden? If Adam was the one who was created and given life and having a relationship with God and then is spiritually and physically dead now, what does that mean for the human race that proceeds from him, his progeny? What are the consequences of his sin? And so we need to ask the question, what is going on here? Are we simply inheriting a sin nature and then we sin and then that's why we go to hell? Or is there something more here in the text? And so there's probably, there's 11 like different ways that people have broken this down. But maybe the two big ones are the imitative and the representative. Okay, let me talk to you about the imitative one. What is the consequence of Adam's sin? I don't think it's the imitative one. Although you could get there from this text. I'm not going to deny that it's outside of orthodoxy. But the imitative example is because Adam sinned and because sin and death came into the world and because we have a fallen nature, some would say, um, in this context, not everybody in that context would say, that we just imitate the sin of Adam and we sin and that's why we're guilty. But I don't know that that's what this text is painting as a picture because it's juxtaposing two separate things. Let me show you what it's juxtaposing by the end of the verse 14. He says, Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So I, I don't think the imitative one works simply just for that phrase that's right there. At least for the people from Adam to Moses, they couldn't imitate Adam in his sin because he sinned in a unique way. So I don't think Paul's trying to communicate an imitative aspect of this idea of sin. What he's trying to do is to show Adam was being and acting as our representative. And the representative act had guilt that then cascaded or was passed down to the progeny of Adam and Eve. And I think you see that very clearly in the coming verses which we'll study next time. Verse 15 says, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more, having the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, uh, Jesus Christ will abound for many. Drop down to verse 18. Therefore, as one trespass led to com condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. This is the, the intricacies, the inner workings of our salvation. Adam was there as a representative of the human race. And as he did that, when he fell, he not only passed on a sin nature, which we'll talk about in a moment, but he passed along the guilt of his sin. This is kind of hard for maybe us to understand in our uh, individ individualistic uh, idea of uh, Western ideals. But in the Bible, it was, it was very clear that a person who's the head of something can act as a representative for all of it. You remember in, uh, it's just a story, uh, 1 Samuel 17, David and Goliath, right? Did both armies, Philistines and the Jews, did they fight each other in chapter 17? No. They sent a representative. They sent a representative and whoever won that was essentially going to win the battle. 
And the people in there wouldn't go, oh, that's not fair. That's the way they chose to fight the battle. This person versus that person. And the way that God set it up is that in the garden, he had Adam act as our representative head, the head of the human race. And his actions then have consequences that pass down to us. The guilt for his sin is now on our head as well. And if you say, I don't like that, how do you think you become a Christian? The act of one person and the benefits are passed on to you. So before I throw out this idea of somebody acting as my representative and head, I need to realize that's the basis of my salvation. Because I don't do anything for it. That's been very clearly made in the book of Romans. I need to understand that, man, when I'm talking about the consequences of Adam's sin, you can write this down letter A. They are consequences that first come corporately. Letter A underneath number two. They come corporately. We've got to think that way. Adam's sin had a corporate consequence to all of humanity. And that is the explicit meaning of the text. We'll talk about what that implies in a moment. But the explicit meaning in the text is that corporately, we all inherit Adam's guilt in the human race. Now that wouldn't, again, I I tell you, wouldn't be a shock to these people. Can I just show you one section of scripture that will prove that to you? Go to Joshua chapter 7. I think that was in Every Day in the Word recently too. Joshua chapter 7. Verses 1 and 2. Joshua 7. Verses 1 and 2. We have the story of Achan. Joshua chapter 7. Verses 1 and 2. That's what it says here. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things, okay? So we have the people of Israel. That's a corporate entity, okay? It's a bunch of people together. It's a nation, the people of Israel. And they're trying to fight their way through the land that God promised to give them. And so the people of Israel, it says, broke faith because he clearly said, you're going to go into this place. You're going to destroy everything. Do not take anything from there. So how did the people, how did the corporate entity break faith? For Achan, singular person, the son of Carmi, the son of Zebdi, the son of Zerah, the son of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. So the action of one person corporately affects everybody. So it's not a shock to somebody like the Jews who Paul is writing to in Rome for them to hear this idea of Adam's um, corporate solidarity that they share with him. I won't bore you with it, but you can look at the Second Temple Judaistic literature to understand what they lost in Adam. They realized the representative nature of Adam in the same way here. Interestingly enough, you're in Joshua 7. Take a look at uh, verse 20. It takes all of this cajoling of Achan to get him to come to the point where he admits that he has taken something, that he has brought this curse upon these people with his sinful actions And look at uh, Joshua 7.20. It says this, And Achan answered Joshua and said this, Truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I did. Notice, when I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar, 200 shekels of silver, and a bar of gold weighing, uh, weighing 50 shekels, then I, watch this, coveted them and took them. And see, they are hidden in the earth underneath my tent with the silver underneath it. Notice again all those languages similar to Genesis 3. Eve saw that the fruit was desirable and good, could make one wise. And when we look at those temptations and we forget that they are ideologies driven by ideas that work everywhere, but in reality, we fall for them. Achan here goes, that stuff is valuable and good. And forgets the command of God. And now that it's brought to his face and he's exposed, he realized, wow, that's true everywhere but reality. I should have done what God wanted me to do. So we see the corporate effects. You can write down Nehemiah chapter 1. We don't have time to turn there. But that's another place where Nehemiah begins to confess the sins of himself and his fathers. And they are personal sins against the holy God. Nehemiah chapter 1, 1 to 10, or 1 to 11 is the whole chapter. You can read the corporate 
thing there. So that's what's going on here. For in, uh, back in Romans chapter five, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. This is the idea of Adam being that corporate, um, that corporate head, being the one who has implications for the rest of the people underneath it. But letter B, notice that it has consequences individually. And this is brilliant by Paul, I think. So there are the corporate effects that we want to say the text is advocating for. But now we're going to say it has individual effects as well. Where we do inherit a sin nature. We're not denying that. So the idea of corporate solidarity is not that, hey, why am I going down just for the sin of Adam? I, all I have to do is take a look at my own life and realize, oh, I've got a bunch of sins to offer God as well. And if you think about it, how did God set you up with a corporate head? You know why I read that section at the beginning of Genesis? It's because I wanted you to see that God gave every advantage. Let me ask you this question. Are you willing to say in your heart of hearts, you would have done better and differently than Adam? Are you ready to admit that? Because Adam, in pristine conditions, with no sin nature, one prohibition from God, and all it took was a little word. Do you think you would have done better? Secondly, have you done better since God gave you life? And that's the individual nature of this. Because Adam is that corporate representative, which is what the text is explicitly stating. And we're going to find that over the coming weeks as we watch how Paul argues between the one man representing all of us and being our salvation and the one man representing all of us and giving us the guilt of sin. He also passed on a sin nature. That is implied in the text. Okay, that's not the explicit argument of the text, but that's the implication of the text. How do we know that? Because that's what Paul argued from chapter 1, verse 18 to chapter 3, verse 20. Do you remember we went through 12 weeks? Why did Paul start not with corporate solidarity, but with that section? I think it's brilliant. My understanding is he starts with 118 to 320 to get to the point in 320 where he says, Every single mouth is closed before God. Why? Because we've all sinned. And now when you get to chapter 5 and you go, well, it's not fair that I have a representative who passed on this guilt. All he has to do is go, did you just agree with me that everybody's mouth is closed because we've all sinned before God? Well, yeah. Well, then you have no argument. He's already exposed that we're all sinners and we've done things against God. So whether you had guilt on you beforehand or not should be no concern to you because you're already proved to be a sinner in the sight of God. That goes back to our first point. Do we understand the consequences that have come from Adam's act on humanity when he let sin and death into the world? That means we're all born sinners. Two passages that you can just write down. Uh, no, I should read one of them. Okay, uh, Psalm 51, verse 5. Psalm 51, verse 5. Just to show you this is not just Paul making this up. The reformers didn't make this up. This is the biblical teaching. Psalm 51, verse 5. We're going to read the first five verses just so you remember how uh, David spoke when he sinned. So to give you the context, Psalm 51, verses 1 to 5 says this. To the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Let me ask you this question. Was Bathsheba David's wife? No. He committed adultery. Okay? So he sinned. Then he had a husband murdered. Then he covered up that murder. So David is a sinner. And notice what David isn't thinking about or blaming anything on. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, plot out my, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. That was Romans 3. Paul says every mouth is shut up. You can't say anything to God. He's justified when he judges any sinner because we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But look at the next verse. Behold... I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, some will try to make the argument, well, maybe David was, uh, you know, a pregnancy outside of wedlock. We don't have that anywhere in the text. You're making an argument from silence. 
And because David was the last of a whole bunch of brothers, it makes sense that uh, their marriage was strong and that they put that together. So you're making an argument from silence to say that David was a child out of wedlock. This is David saying, I was brought forth in iniquity. I understand human nature. I realize that I'm a sinner. And that doesn't exonerate me from all the stuff that I just did. God, I sinned in your sight. I know why it happened. Because I have a sinful nature. But God, I'm asking you to forgive me, cleanse me, wash me, create in me a clean heart. All these things that God alone can do in salvation. Next text. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Pastor Matt, you can have those high schoolers skip the first day if they want. I'll just tell them right now what, what Pastor Mike's going to say. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Notice Paul's argument here. Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, according to the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit of uh, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind and were, here we go, by nature, children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So this is implied in what Adam has passed on to us back in Romans because we know what Paul taught beforehand and we see the guilt that we've inherited and we understand, oh, if we came from two sinners, our nature is going to be that as well. Go back to Romans chapter 5. Notice what it says there. Because all sin, verse 13, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. That's why, again, I don't think the imitative uh, idea works here because these people, at least from Adam to Moses, couldn't sin like Adam. It's not imitating him. What does that mean? Well, think about those two epochs in human history, Adam and Moses. These are men who have received divine revelation that they are accountable for, special revelation from God specifically given to them so they might follow it. But what happened in the interim period between Adam and and Moses. We don't have the law of God given down. That doesn't mean that God didn't give a law. Remember what Paul's argument was in 118 to 132. Romans 132 says, those who do these things know that they deserve death. We said that God has on every image bearer whose image has been tarnished because of sin a conscience, and that conscience bears witness to them. So there is sin. This text is not saying there was no sin. They just sinned differently than Adam. And notice Adam's was called a transgression or a trespass because God specifically set up boundaries and Adam stepped outside of it. But between Adam and Moses, the boundaries weren't as specific. So it's not like those sins that were there. But when God gets to Moses, he gets very specific, doesn't he? Ten commandments codified. All those Ten Commandments you can see broken between Genesis chapter 3 and Exodus chapter 19 because mankind knows in their hearts they should do these things. If you ever have doubt on that, you can read The Abolition of Man from C.S. Lewis. It's a tiny little book, very weighty thought subject. But he's making an argument that all humans, every race that's ever existed, all ethnicities, we all believe inherently the same types of things that to steal another person's wife, to murder somebody, to covet. These things, are, these things are wrong. We might define them a little differently. There might be different punishments for them. But why is there this constant frame of every human that goes, yeah, that's the way it should be. When we talk about shoulds and oughts, we have to talk about something that is overarching. And that is the conscience on every person in the human race. Yet death reigned over uh, everyone from Adam to Moses. So that shows you that sin was definitely in the world. They didn't sin like Adam, but because sin and death came into the world through there, you, you know that it was there. But notice this last phrase, who was a type of the one who was to come. It's point number three on your outline this way. Let's rejoice in the coming one. Paul has set us up with these last beautiful words here. Adam was a type of the one to come. Verses 15 to 21 will be that extrapolation of all of this. Adam is a type of the one to come. Type in the original language can mean example. 
something that you press and you create like a, an exact image. You're trying to make it look exactly like it. So Adam was a type of the one to come. Who was the coming one? Well, we studied this back at Christmas time, but do you remember Genesis 3.15? The coming one was the one who would crush the head of the serpent. In God's grace, amidst judgment, he's always promised salvation. And the coming one in this text, with all the devastation that sin has come into the world and done, God says, I will redeem you. And I will do it through this one. This one, Jesus Christ, as the rest of the text will say. He's a type where Adam failed, Christ succeeded. And because Christ succeeded, he can be the captain of our salvation. Do you want to conceptualize it? You have the Titanic, okay? And the captain drives the Titanic into the iceberg. Was it the other people's fault? That, they, that the captain did that? No, not technically, but they are on the boat and now they need to jump into a lifeboat. And Jesus is there with a lifeboat saying, come to me, I'll, I'll take you off of this sinking ship because Jesus is the one who won our salvation. How did he do it? Go with me to Matthew chapter four. Let's rejoice in this coming one. Matthew chapter four. Look at the first 10 verses. Matthew chapter 4 says this, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by, same as Adam, the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. So now look, the enemy is the same. We have the devil here. He was in the garden. He's our ancient foe. But notice, circumstances are very different where was Adam? In the delight of a pristine, precious creation created by God. Where is Jesus? In the wilderness. Okay, you've been in the wilderness before? There's, there's chaos that can rule there. There's no order there. He's in the wilderness. Notice what Adam had, every advantage. Jesus, after fasting 40 days, is now physically weak in the sight of the tempter. And the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Satan, your idea makes sense everywhere but reality. You know what reality is? Living by the truth of God. Verse five, then the devil took him up to the holy city and set him at the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on the hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. Notice that the devil again twists the word of God. Jesus won't fall for it like Adam and Eve. Again, he says it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and you shall serve him only. See that phrase right there? Be gone, Satan. Had Adam done that in the garden, he would have protected the human race from sin and guilt. Remember, we read that Adam was standing there watching his wife be taken advantage of by the serpent. And what the man, the head of the human race, the champion that we looked to to save us, what Adam did is nothing and passively took the fruit and brought guilt upon us all. But Jesus, knowing the cross was coming, in the midst of the wilderness says, Be gone, Satan. I will worship God and him alone. That is why he can be our representative and offer to us a salvation that we receive simply by grace through faith, which can never be taken from us because we did nothing to earn it. So let's go to God right now and ask him that he'd give us the ability to rejoice in the coming one who has saved us from our sins. Father, with these deep truths, may we be humbled. May we realize, like J.C. Ryle said at the beginning of the sermon, that we will live like pilgrims when we understand what has happened to this world and to us 
God, may we so desperately cling to the scriptures that we long to live like the one who has saved us, Jesus Christ, who did what we could not do. The perfect human, the perfect merely human person, Adam, could not succeed. But where he failed, Christ conquered. And his conquering allows us to come to God, stand in grace, receive justification, reconciliation, and all that we've been blessed with. God, may we never forget that it simply comes through no effort of our own and it cost Jesus everything. So Father, help us to sing differently, live differently, serve differently because we've been loved by the Savior who died for us and rose again three days later. In his name we pray, amen.